Well, today we have returning with us our friend Steve Wilgos, who is the host or administrator for Hiking for Patches. Steve will talk a little bit about Hiking for Patches with us tonight, but what we really want to pick his brain about is the Northeast Kingdom Hiking Challenge. That's one that's on my bucket list, and we'll get into what exactly the Northeast Kingdom Challenge is in just a minute. But Steve, first, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, great. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be back. Steve, you've been pretty busy. You've been getting some hikes in, I see. Um, we follow each other on Facebook and I see on social media, you're, as I mentioned, you're walk, working on these Northeast Kingdom hikes. But as far as the Facebook page goes, any recent changes or updates, anything been added that's noteworthy at this point? There hasn't been quite as many new challenges uh, I've seen of late. It seemed like there was a little bit of a flurry, especially during the early parts of the pandemic. I think there were a lot more people that were trying to do things privately. Um, obviously, we all know what happened with all the outdoor activities, everybody trying to get outdoors more, and it seemed to have a whole big surge in a lot of these challenges with focusing people on where to go and new things to try and and uh, and then just even uh, trying to disperse traffic too. I know that's how a lot of these smaller challenges came up was trying to pull people away from overloading the high peaks up in the Adirondacks. Um, so it seems like a lot of that has settled in a little bit more, and I haven't seen as much brand new activity, um, probably partly due to, you know, what I just said, you know, your, people are kind of coming down off of the big surge, but also there seems to be a little bit of a saturation. I don't know that there's a lot of new places that you can really push people to without getting so much into the minutia that it becomes a little laughable. Yeah, at least here in the New York and even in the Northeast in general. There are a lot of them out there. You could you could spend a lot of years trying to accomplish all of these challenges. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think you kind of hit it with mentioning New York. I mean, it's there, I think there are probably more challenges just in the state of New York than all the rest of the country slash world combined. I, I mean, I actually wouldn't be surprised if mathematically I went through that and that was an accurate statement. Um, I know there's a couple areas, like I think there might be something out in Arizona where there's a lot of sub challenges, but in terms of purely unique uh, challenges to a town or a mountain range, things like that. Uh, yeah, New York's really got it in high gear. And that probably speaks a lot to that whole Northeast competitiveness attitude, whereas, you know, you have a million choices of where to hike in Colorado, yet I don't know that there's much by way of official challenges outside of the 14ers and the 13ers and stuff like that. Yeah, it could be a cultural difference. I was out west this summer. I hiked a good part of the Tahoe Rim Trail with my middle son. And going out there, I thought, let me see if there's any challenges out there. Maybe there's some I can even work on while I'm out on the trail. And yeah, just a little bit more laid back, just like their yeah. trails. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot more hiking for the sake of hiking elsewhere. And, you know, I, I, I probably have talked about that before. And I know I've definitely talked about it with friends. It's it, there's yin and yang to it, right? It's it's uh, the challenges. A lot of people roll their eyes and say, why don't you just enjoy nature? But, you know, uh, one of the things I've genuinely enjoyed about the challenges is just it focuses attention on places I might never have thought to go. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had strangers. It's the first time they've met me and it was part of a challenge hike. I posted on a, you know, like a meetup group and they, they go, wow, this is really close to where I live. And I never even knew this trail was here. This is gorgeous. So it just depends on your own personal perspective on what you're looking for. I know for myself and friends I hike with, yeah, it's not necessarily competitive, more of, yeah, this is just a reason to, just an excuse to get out and hike. And it's also exposed us to areas we may not have hiked in. For example, we're working on views and Bruce is one of the lists we're working on. So the challenge now is we're getting further and further away from our home to find these hikes to go on, but we're finding new areas to do these hikes. Uh, another example with us is the Catskill Highest 100, working on that. We call that our filler hikes. You know, if, we, if, we're, if the whole group isn't going, well, okay, let's just go knock off one of these Catskill Highest 100s. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. And, you know, it's just kind of a way, you know, you feel like you're hiking for a purpose, maybe. So I, I kind of go back and forth on that too. Do I need a reason to hike? No, but sometimes when you're chipping away at a, a list, that might give you a little bit of motivation to get out there on a weekend when you might be saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to sit this one out. 
Yeah, well, yeah, that's absolutely something that I've leaned on a few times along the way is, is just having that goal, that purpose where I might not necessarily be time bound, but just knowing that I want to get to it. And I personally feel a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a rush from the excitement of working on a goal, as well as just the pure being in nature portion of it. I mean, I just I'm a project manager by trade. So just the the planning and the logistics and everything that goes into it. I, I'm one of those nerds that actually loves that stuff. And it's why I've been a hike leader with a couple of different groups. So I, that part of it is something that working on a challenge actually focuses my energy on instead of just waking up saying, I don't know where I'm going to go today. And then by the time I've scoured all trails or checked social media to see what other people are doing, good weather, well, then all of a sudden an hour and a half has gone by and I go, ah, now, now I'm just going to have brunch <laughs> and not go out. <laughs> so already having like a plan and a goal and a purpose, I think probably gets me into the woods a little bit more often than if I were just winging it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same. Absolutely. Now, one of the challenges you're working on is the Northeast Kingdom Challenge. I've hiked the long trail. I wrote a book about it. I'll take this opportunity to give a shameless plug for my book, Switching Gears, available on Amazon. Go check it out. I love that state. I had such a great time. I had as much fun off the trail as on the trail. When I saw the Northeast Kingdom challenge i immediately said okay that needs to be on my list that's when i have to go chasing steve i came across some of your posts i guess just a couple of weeks ago and i see that you're up there working on the northeast kingdom challenge yeah i i honestly can't remember how i first stumbled across it i mean the the logical conclusion would be i somebody posted it and in, in hiking for badges but I, I know that area just from getting up there to visit some of the breweries. I mean, the world's most highest graded uh, brewery is in Greensboro, Hill Farmstead. And, and that's not very far away. It's a little bit further west, but it's relatively uh, easy to get to from where you'd go to hike in that area. And just that combination of some of the great beer and the views, just the natural beauty any single time of year. It just it has everything I want and it's perfect for some of these long weekend getaways. You know, I, I live in New York City, so you, you're obviously flipping 180 degrees away from my day to day experience to get up there where everything is quiet and remote and sort of middle of nowhere, um, which is what I want and need uh, as escapes. And it's so it's just so overwhelming in terms of its physical beauty there and I, I try to make it a point to get up there at least once a year during one of the holiday breaks how many peaks are there in the northeast kingdom uh it recently and by recently i think within the last maybe two years went to 20 i think originally there were 19 uh there was one of them on the list and forgive me i forget the name uh that had some access issues i don't know if it was private property or something along those lines uh, so there was some question, it got replaced. And then just a lot of people, I think in the area started banging the drum and just say, we want a round number. Why 19? It's so weird. So they ended up uh, replacing and adding and just making it around 20 to complete the whole challenge. And where are you at with the challenge at this point, Steve? Uh, the, the fall foliage hike I did a couple of weeks ago gave me 15, 16 and 17. So um, I think it's Gore and Middle Mountain are two that can be done together in one fairly decent sized day hike. Uh, I know it's double digits total miles to hit those two. And then there's one final left on the uh, on the long trail that I'd like to do when I start section hiking the long trail in the future. So hopefully that one will be my finale on a on a end to end hike there. Yeah, unfortunately, those are the only two I have done at this point. So I've got to get busy. I have 18 to go. Yeah, it's a it's a haul. Um, and especially if you go during prime season, um, either be prepared to spend a lot of money on an Airbnb or plan your trip well in advance because lodging is not easy to get. Uh, so either go the camping route, but it is it, I mean, it's such even though it's it's really busy, it's spaced out enough that you don't feel crowded. Um, but but definitely in terms of lodging, it's pretty challenging to get up there during uh, fall foliage season. But I mean, complete sensory overload. It's stunning. Just the drive between mountains is gorgeous when you get in some of these small two lane roads and you just kind of get in that funnel of the asphalt or sometimes the dirt roads in front of you with all the colors on either side, just forming that wall. It's it's 
like even just talking about it now, just the images come into my head like it was five minutes ago. And it is such a beautiful state and you never feel crowded there. It's like you said, it, you've got all these back roads, these country roads. It's yeah. And that, that just has to make it feel like almost, I don't know, my experience, I did it in the summer. I hiked the long trail in the summer, but you almost feel like you're stepping back in time. You know? Yeah. You stop yeah. in a small town and you've got this little mom and pop convenience store, right? Not the super convenience stores we see all, all over the place now. You know, you're, it's just a mom and pop operation. You stop in, get a Gatorade or a snack and, the people live there or grew up in the area. It's it's really a unique place to to spend time. And, and you know, one of the things that don't sleep on when you're hiking up in those areas is my goodness, everybody can cook. Every single restaurant. I don't care how off the beaten path it is, you will have an A-list meal at all of those places. So it's also great when you've really poured out a lot of calories on the trail. And uh, it's nice to sit back with uh, a good beer, local beer, and uh, and a real hearty meal. It's just fantastic. Yeah, and don't go there expecting to find your favorite chain restaurant or fast food restaurant. Oh no, no. Yeah. Right, you're you're going to get local cuisine. You're going to get you're like likely going to be in a restaurant that's owned by people, like I said, that have probably grown up in the area. Yeah, it just it's it's a total part of the experience. It really is. I mean, you're not just going to have a quick bite and then head back to go to sleep. I mean, just being out there and talking to the people and 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 you I I don't know, personally I've never gotten the sense that you get the side eye of being uh, you know, a carpetbagger <laughs> rolling in going, you know, you're I'm here to consume your local foliage and and uh, then just head out of town. People seem to be they understand that that part of that tourist experience is is uh, what they're going to expect living in a place as beautiful as they do. And and I've always had genuine conversations with people. It's not like, oh, oh, really? You're here to hike. It's it's almost like they're surprised if you would, if that answer would not be that. So they're pretty used to it. And, and, you know, they'll ask you what trails or what mountains you're going to. And yeah, it's just you get a real good sense of local community there that's not too insular. Yeah, I think they just really get the uh, reciprocal effect of, uh, you know, what they have, their uniqueness of where they're at and the benefit of people wanting to go there. And on my long trail experience, whether it was Bennington, Rutland, um, any of the towns, West, Ch West um, uh, Manchester Center was the other one. They just, they understand that, you know what, we're good to these hikers, you know, and, you know, and they're very polite. And in turn, it feeds their economy, whether it's people that are leaf peeping, hiking, or in the wintertime, the people up there skiing. And that's refreshing because you don't get that all the time. Some I, I grew up in New Jersey, and I know along the Jersey Shore, some of the locals just absolutely resented people coming down, which I never yeah. got. Yeah. Yeah, you get a lot of the same in Florida as well. It's, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they don't want the tourists there, regardless of the money it brings. But yeah, I never get that sense in Vermont. It really, it, it truly is my favorite place to to go hike outside of my local New York trails. And and it's just something I absolutely and utterly look forward to every year. I mean, October is my favorite month and just being able to get up there and hike during that month in such a great state like Vermont is, it's just, it, it, it genuinely is one of the highlights of my year every single year. It never gets old. Mm -hmm. Now, it was around the same time that you were up there. My friends and I were doing a hike in the Catskills and we got to the trailhead and had to... Actually, we didn't even get out of the car and a police officer came driving by and telling people to move because it was so crowded. Yeah. Uh, and that was seemed to be the case at a lot of the trailheads. We ended up finding a place where there was a bushwhack. So there was like one other car parked where we were where we ended up starting our hike. Did you find that at these trails when you were up there this in your past hikes? Uh no. I mean, there there was probably one that it, the parking lot was two thirds full and I was stunned actually to see that many cars in one place. I mean, it was, it was on a Saturday, right? So you're, you definitely had more people getting out, but I went up on a Thursday night, did a little bit of hiking Friday afternoon, um, you know, got out and hiked all day Saturday and yeah, you definitely saw a little more traffic on Saturday, but again, it was never crowded. I, I think, I think on one of the peaks uh, we saw, I think we saw like three different couples that all went by within about five or 10 minutes and that it was startling 
to see that many people close together. And it, it made you aware of how quiet it is the rest of the time, because you you're like something that you would get routinely hiking anywhere in the Catskills or the Adirondacks was just uh, very surprising to experience in Vermont. You go, oh, wait a minute, why are there multiple people? This is very strange. So yeah, you, you can definitely get away from it all a little bit more there. Yeah, it's a slow day in the Catskills or the Adirondacks if you only see a couple of cars in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, quite the opposite there. Yeah. You mentioned that you were able to double up on a hike are there many opportunities in the northeast kingdom challenge to do multiple peaks in a hike yeah there, there's a decent handful um i i I'd have to just kind of scan my memory bank a little bit more but i think there's even one section where if, you know if you really got after it you could do four possibly five in a day um you know it's biting off quite a lot uh, and especially too for someone like me, where that's a six hour drive each way, I don't necessarily target that because um, if you hit that many in one day, that means you're then having, having to uh, get to another section, another area, and then you start adding more driving into your running around. So generally speaking, like for someone like me, I would space it out and say, oh, all right, maybe hit one Friday night, a couple Saturday, one Sunday morning before heading home. But if you, if you, were more aggressive and said, I just don't want to do that drive as many times. You definitely have options to compact that into much more um, aggressive targets and fewer overall trips to do it. You stayed in Airbnbs when you were up there. Uh, are there opportunities if people want to try to backpack some of these or are there campgrounds in the area that you know of? Um, yeah, there's definitely some campgrounds. I, I'm going to say backpacking, there are few opportunities the way they are laid out. Uh, you know, again, the two that we talked about that are on the long trail, you could obviously do that. But everything else, they are spread out a little bit more. Um, some of the ones that I actually just hit, you could have linked some of them together, but you would be making very, very large days out of it if you really wanted to go through trail systems to do it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I guess kind of the moral of the story is you can make of it whatever you want to make of it. Um, from an efficiency standpoint, backpacking is probably not your prime. But if you were more of the relaxed type and just said, hey, I just really want to get away from it all for a couple of days, you could definitely look for opportunities to string inefficient trails together to just stay out there and get it done. All right. If you're going to go up there, if you're looking for a five day or seven day outing, you can look at the map and say, OK, over the course of this many days, I can. I could pick a few of these off. Yeah, I mean, they do get a little spread out. I mean, one of the things I do like about um, hiking up in Vermont is, especially when you're hopping around trying to hit cheese, beer, and hiking, you know, the the holy tr trinity of things I like to hit in Vermont. Um, you know, it seems like virtually nothing is more than an hour away unless you're just going full top to bottom in the state. But again, it's, it's not quite as... Uh, through in terms of hiking ability but again you, if you really just wanted to map it out i think you could probably do some of that mm -hmm. yeah my wife and i are considering a trip up there next year and if i go with her we're obviously staying at an airbnb she's not a hiker and not too much into camping but i like the backpack and i'm always looking for my next backpacking adventure yeah, it, that yeah, I there, there's a lot of that um, personal turmoil in, in terms of making those choices because I do love I love being out there. I love doing it. I love the idea of all the things that go with camping, but there's just something to be said also for completing an 11 mile day that includes a lot of elevation change about having a nice bed to crash into, having a <laughs> restaurant meal instead of a quick campfire meal. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess as I'm getting older, <laughs> I tend to look for a little bit more of the recovery that comes out of the creature comforts. Um, but I do have a pretty big backpacking trip planned for uh, for next year. So, you know, that, that might be something we could talk about uh, <laughs> on a future episode. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think as we get older, we might get a little softer. I've been I've been backpacking since 1972. Okay, my 50th anniversary backpacking. And I recently was interviewing somebody who had written an article for, uh, it was Backpacker Magazine, about comparing the gear from the 70s to today's gear. And his father was probably about my age, based on what he was telling me and stories he told me his father had from gear from the 70s. And I thought about back then, 
just throwing my sleeping bag on the ground and going to sleep. No sleeping pads and sleeping mattresses. No, definitely not. Uh, so yeah, we get a little softer and I'm with you on that. I'm not going to fight my wife. If she wants to go up there, she's already said, yeah, you get up early in the morning and do a hike, come back and we can have a early dinner, late lunch, whatever. And I'm good with that. Nice hot meal, nice comfortable bed, hot shower to jump into. Yeah. Yeah. The more you say it out loud, the more it makes me feel good in my decision to do that as opposed to the, the roughing it element. It, it's, it has its fun, but yeah. But Steve, you're a backpacker. We do enough of that. I, <laughs> I just did that for 10 days out around Lake Tahoe. So yeah, I, 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 I'm not that soft. I do enough of that, but I'm not going to pass up the opportunity to insult all those engineers and people put all the hard work into having indoor plumbing and, you know, people running these great restaurants. I'm not going <laughs> right. to insult them, right? I'm going right. to take advantage of it. <laughs> there you go. That's a good way to look at it. I like that approach. Elevation in these peaks, because these aren't the highest peaks in terms of elevation in Vermont. The five highest ones are well, on, I think all of them are on the long trail. I know I've completed the Vermont Five Challenge, uh, and they all, yeah, they they all go along the the long trail. But it's not always elevation. It's not always the the I should say the height of the peak. Oh yeah, it's that elevation gain. Yeah. What do you, what would you talk? What would you say about that in terms of the elevation gain you have on these peaks? You get you definitely get some good variety. Um, Right. The, the elevation change is still there. A couple of these are pretty simple. Um, I think maybe the first couple, three I did were so easy. I thought, wow, this isn't going to be much of a challenge. And then I hit a couple others that uh, that got a little aggressive. I mean, there was one on this trip um, and I, I don't know. I, I get names confused all the time now, even though I just did them, the names will start blurring in my head, but yeah, it was uh, it was a quick Friday where I realized I had a meeting canceled and I said, oh, great, let's go do this midday instead of waiting till later. And then we'll come back and work in the evening. So we split the day work, hike, work. And I said, oh, this will be great. And then about um, about a mile and a quarter into the hike, I was already drenched in sweat and my heart was pounding. And uh, yeah, so much for that easy hike where we just dash up the mountain. Plus, there had been some precip. So uh, there were wet leaves and there were a couple pieces where I had to, I had to really take my hiking poles and sort of chuck them up and you're using your hands to pull up. So yeah, it, not full on scrambling, but legitimate elevation change with some steepness and things where you could get hurt if you were screwing around. So uh, definitely were not, was not as easy overall as some of the early ones I did. You get a, a wide range of experiences doing this challenge. Yeah, because I think people who aren't, very familiar with hiking peaks. Well, I'm going to hike uh, Slide Mountain. It's the highest peak in the Catskills, but definitely not the most difficult. <laughs> right, right. It's the elevation gain that gets you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and plus the terrain, too. I mean, there were a couple of these that had, um, you know, that infamous Catskills experience of a lot of roots and sticks where you're having to have keep your head down during most of your footsteps. And, yeah. and I've definitely experienced that too, where you're, you're feeling it. And um, yeah, if you're not careful, uh, you could definitely get yourself hurt on a few of them. So, you know, the, it's it, the challenge part of it definitely comes into play, not just the completion of ticking, uh, you know, bagging peaks, right. It's, you, you can get a workout on quite a lot of these. Yeah, absolutely. Do these peaks all have trails or, or is it a mixture of trails and bushwhacks? Uh, no, everything is trails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and pretty, I mean, pretty well marked many of these. Um, I, I, I think the, I think you really get a, a good sense of how they take pride in, in their hiking experience up there by uh, how well marked most of it is. I mean, you're you only have a couple of instances where you know how a, a blaze might just be at the right angle where where you're standing you can't see it so you might have a few of those where you have to wander around a little bit but you're not really sitting out there going all right now i need a map or i need to check my phone map to figure out where i'm going it's pretty well marked you feel pretty comfortable and confident being out there that uh you're going to know where you're going and how to get there yeah i noticed on some of the side trails in 2021, I went up to Vermont. I hiked Massachusetts, Northern Massachusetts, part of the AT, and then made my way into Vermont and started doing some of the side trails. 
that's another challenge for those of us who like our hiking challenges is doing the side trails for the green mountain club and they do a great job maintaining the trails keeping them marked and it's great to hear that and in, especially in an area so remote as the northeast kingdom because you're not near any of the so-called cities i mean the city in vermont is the size of like a small town so you live in new york city right yeah yeah, I mean, people, you know, uh, with some of these people have asked me, oh, where did you stay or where were you hiking? And I was like, I just got back from there a day ago and I honestly can't remember the name of the town I was in. It, it was just so, um, it, it's just a place that you wouldn't normally go to unless you were going specifically for that reason. And it's not even a pass-through part of the state. Like it, it is a destination specific uh, area. So <laughs> if you're not truly just paying attention to like, oh, I've driven by that sign on the highway a bunch of times, like, nope, nope, you're going there to go there. And that's it. Right. All right. I'm, my, my experience in North Troy, which is the northern terminus of the long trail, you get there and there's you know, a bed and breakfast. I think uh, some, there's like two or three, maybe four establishments at the most. The Dollar General, which seems to be the hot spot of the town, that seems to be where all the action is. My son and I stopped in there and said, well, I think every, in the half hour we were there, I think every person in town may have stopped in the Dollar General. It's such a small town, but everybody's just so friendly. And yeah. as I was saying that it's incredible that with such a, a, a small population near these trails, that you still have people dedicated enough to go out and do the work or the work is getting done because even ones that are maintained by state authorities or county authorities, that's a commitment to get crews out there to do the work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Are you plan on finishing any of these in the winter? Or are you just going to kind of put this on hold until, till after mud season? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's my, generally speaking, I go into the year hoping to get to Vermont twice. I, I would, in my mind, the perfect scenario is, is uh, 4th of July uh, holiday weekend and then sometime in October. Um, for me, just the sheer uh, distance with the drive is something I don't really like to undertake with a place that can be so uh, weather sporadic. So uh, especially a lot of friends that have done things like the uh, the winter fire tower challenge or the winter Adirondacks. Coming from where I am to have to commit that much drive time to something that may not result in a payoff it's just not uh it's not a chance i'm willing to take it's almost like um, a lot of the holistic fishermen that say i don't care if i catch fish i'm just happy to be out here and i said no i'd i'd rather just catch fish <laughs> so yeah. that's kind of how i look at it too it's not like oh i had a really nice drive and we got halfway up the trail and i just liked that part of the hike i i am one of those that needs the payoff so i, I tend to avoid going that far north during the winter yeah. My friends and I, we've done, I believe it's 12 of the Adirondack 46s. And that's a bit of a deterrent for us because for, you know, it's, I think it's a four and a half hour drive for us to get up there. And unlike the Catskills, which is about two and a half hour drive, you're not going to just drive up there, hike and then go home that night. It's, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a commitment right. and you, you want to be right. sure of yourself. Like you said, you want to be sure that you get up there, you finished and maybe even more importantly that you're not wiped out on that ride home. Yeah, you know, that's the point as well. I mean, that's also a safety consideration is how many times have I carpooled with people out of the city? You know, being being somebody who actually owns an SUV in Manhattan is uh, a little bit of an anomaly from a hiking standpoint. So obviously I've been a, a popular driver over the years doing all the Catskills challenges and two and a half hour ride home after you've just busted it all day and your alarm went off at 5.30 in the morning. It is it is a little bit of a safety concern to be uh, to be alert and especially if you're in the winter and dealing with some foul weather yeah now back to the peaks up in the northeast kingdom as we know not every peak has a great view and as a matter of fact a lot of the catskill 35 there's quite a few that you don't have any view at all you get up there sign a canister or if it's on a trail you pass it by okay i did this How, what are the views like overall on, the, on these summits in the northeast kingdom I'm going to say the majority of them have pretty good views. There are a couple uh, that don't. Uh, actually, that, that resulted in me uh, doing a game time change of plans for the day I was up there on this recent trip was 
you know, I had mentioned wanting to do uh, Gore and Mill on a big Saturday hike. Um, and I really had been so long that I had actually uh, done my research on those and downloaded the maps. I had just forgotten the description. So realizing what time of year I was up there, I took, did a quick look at the reports. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, there's a viewpoint at one point. But realistically, the mountains themselves don't have views. So that's why we decided to scrub those. And actually, I did something that I had done uh, a year ago that has probably less views um, in the entire area. So, you know, that's that, that is unusual to have them that don't have views. But there is that small handful where that comes into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it does. Those are just enjoyable hikes or the view might be on the way up and some of those in my experience sometimes you find a nice view on the way up or uh, you know on the way down possibly or you just uh, you, you want to put a silver lining on it just a nice hike yeah that's the case with some of them i call bluff so technically there's bluff and south bluff and south bluff is the one that has the uh it, it's a viewpoint on the way right close to the summit uh, but the true summit there is some, something where you have to pop a couple miles further north. It's almost like just a little spur out and back. And yeah, there's really nothing there. So it's only for purists to, to go do that. But it's the way up actually has the viewpoints. Um, so it, help, it helps for some of these to do your research and not just assume that they're all great. Because, uh, you know, like I said, with this one, we said, I don't want to burn this on a day that quite literally everybody said was the same best weekend to hike the entire year in the state of Vermont in that area. So I was glad that we just decided to dump those for another day and uh, do something else in our view. Steve, you talked about you don't want to drive too far in the winter, but do you have any winter hiking plans? Uh, you know, interesting. I haven't, I, I did quite a lot of that for several years when I was pursuing my Catskill 3500 club winters. And then actually not long after that was when uh, I had done my very, uh, <laughs> my very intense uh, Alps trip. And coming out of that, I ended up with Achilles tendonitis, where I was told to shut it down for about three or four months completely. So that blew out the winter of uh, 1920. And then, of course, with the pandemic, everything changed a little bit. So it sort of broke my momentum in terms of getting out there. And then without without a, a challenge, a winter challenge to kind of drive me, I, I'm just going to be honest, I got pretty lazy about getting out there doing winter hiking. And in spite of how much I praise it to people that are just looking to get started on it, I tell them, I said, actually, I think the hiking is easier. <laughs> you're, mm -hmm. you're on top of all those roots and rocks and, and uneven terrain. And, you know, as long as you're not the one breaking trail, or if you're super into fitness and that's how you want to work out your body by breaking trail, you know, it, I think the hiking itself is a lot easier. It's just making sure you have the proper, you know, clothing from a safety perspective and and understanding when your daylight is and knowing if something goes wrong, can you, you know, stay alive in the cold for a little bit. But, you know, the safety planning intimidates a lot of people. But once you just know how to do it properly, it's it's absolutely glorious. So a very long-winded answer to your question is, no, I don't have any plans, but I probably should get back at it this year. I was intimidated to do winter hiking. Um, it was when we were pursuing the Catskill 35 that I started. I, I had done plenty of winter camping trips as a volunteer with the Boy Scouts, but never a winter hike. But once I started, as you said, it's a, it's a great experience. And I'll put it out there. When you're doing these bushwhacks, yeah, we'd get up, we wouldn't get to the trailhead till about sometime between quarter to 10 and 10 30 usually more often than not somebody was ahead of us somebody had broken trail <laughs> and it would make getting to those summits on those bushwhacks a lot faster that's, and like you said I'm that's the the best. yeah yeah uh we did double top before that was shut down and when we went up and did it for the winter hike we were like wow this was so much faster being able to follow somebody else's track to get up here oh yeah yeah but then for every one of those, I have the flashback uh, PTSD moments of having already made the plans, uh, already arranged the carpool and all of that, and then getting up there to find that there's three and a half feet of fresh snow that came down the night yeah. before. And I'm slowly losing my will to go on living, doing five minute all 
<laughs> uh, altering of who's uh, breaking the trail, swapping back and forth. So yeah, it, uh, it, 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 I guess it's one of those where whatever doesn't kill you makes for good storytelling later. And it is Thanks. fun to tell those stories, but oh my goodness, it, it's not fun at all being in the middle of it. Oh, I know. We've we've had plenty of those moments as well. And not just on Bushwax. We've shown up a few times where what was it? we did a, a Eagle and I'm trying to remember the other one that was up there that we did that day. That's on that 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 same trail. And yeah, it was fresh snow and we were first ones out there. We were breaking trail. And that's yeah, that's a that's a tougher, tougher hike. Yeah, then then you're learning what makes winter hiking more difficult. Yeah, that that actual hike is one that I do use to tell our stories about where I had a friend who wasn't feeling well. Uh, he decided to break off after Eagle and I gave him the keys to the car. And by the time the other three of us broke, got to the second mountain and got back, the uh, the wind had already swept away any traces of my friend having ever been there, even though it was probably only, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half later. It was like no use of us in, in spite of some shoes going through there. Yeah, you look at that. There's uh, there's areas that comes to mind is that um, wow, giant ledge and uh, going over to Panther. You got those sections there where the wind really whips and you can go back 15, 20 minutes later and your footprints are just blown away. Yeah, it, it, it's it's an intimidating thought, but when you're out there, it it's uh, yeah, it, it is just something where the natural beauty of it is something that's hard to describe. You can't see it on TV and experience it the same way. You know, I, I had that conversation with a friend of mine that you know, hikes with me sporadically um, in the different seasons, and was tr you know, I kept trying to say you should come more often because I know it's a long drive, but the things you get to actually see are things. I've never been able to show you with photos on my phone because sometimes you just look at it and say, I can't capture this. It's impossible to capture this with the phone. So it's just pointless. And so you just put it away and you say, I'm just going to experience being alive here. And it's, you know, it, it's a little bit of uh, a frou-frou thinking, but when you, when you do recognize the value in it, it does help those memories burn in. And it's something you can still talk about five years later and remember it like it was yesterday because it's so it's so sensory overload in terms of that experience and um yeah i mean just being out there some of those winter elements when you just everything's so quiet and it's it's almost it's awe inspiring in a way but also um reverential in terms of like letting you know that mother nature is in charge and deigns to allow you to experience this <laughs> it's, yeah. and it, it kind of puts you in your place a little bit yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, and you know, going back to those, going, uh, you experience, it's a different experience, right? You can say, well, I've already hiked this. No, when you go back and do it in the winter, you're experiencing it in a totally different way. It sounds different, smells different, and the views are different because the leaves are off the tree. Uh, I just, yeah, I'm so glad I got into winter hiking. Yeah, I, you know, I've actually had a couple of those conversations with my friend we were talking about uh, previously, you know, we were working on the New England Trail, and there have been a few of these ridge views where you get up there and say, oh, there's a little pocket where you can get out and see, but then you realize if you did this hike in the wintertime with all these leaves down, I mean, you'd probably be able to see 50 miles um, out there, and it would be, I mean, incomprehensibly another experience you say, oh, this is really beautiful and it's green, a little bit of color and it's really nice, but yeah, it would be, it would be breathtaking to do that with snow on the ground and, and the visibility that would be afforded with the leaves off the trees. And it's interesting you say that because we find ourselves a lot of times on our hikes saying, wow, coming back here in the winter, you could, you'd be able to see right through all of this. And there's yeah. one heck of a view on the other side of all these trees. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, Steve, well, Goss, well um, thanks so much for agreeing to come back on the podcast. Uh, and thank you for what you're doing with Hiking for Patches with the face group page. I encourage everybody to go check that out. And look, these are just, some of these are just a lot of fun to do. You know, it just comes down to sometimes they're just a lot of fun. Sometimes they can be what motivates you to get out there and hike. But, you know, thanks for creating that that space where we can all go and and find these and, and hear and hear the experience of other hikers 
Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, as always, it's great to talk to you. And, you know, it, it's obviously a subject that we're all passionate about. We're, you know, speaking here or listening to this podcast. So, um, you know, hopefully it gives people a little bit of a, you know, that chill and that motivation, you know, th to uh, further explore and try different things and, and experience new places that might get you a little out of your comfort zone or, or maybe you would be comfortable, but you just didn't even know it was out there. Um, yeah. And so it's just great being able to share that. I, I love that it's out there and just seeing the enthusiasm and it's, it basically self runs at this point. And it's just really, really exciting to see the way it's taken life and how much pleasure people get out of it. So I appreciate you taking the talk to me about it and, and uh, converse about this uh, great activity that we all love so much and giving opportunity for people to be more aware of the site and uh, how they can make use of it. And Steve, we want to have you back on. We want to talk about this backpacking trip you have coming up. That'll, that'll be for another conversation. We'd love to have you on to talk about that. Sounds good. I'm sure we'll be plenty of stories coming out of that one. That's great. Hey, everybody, get outside, have some fun, and be safe.